Ladies and gentlemen, Vega has been one of the strangest product launches in history for technology, especially when GPUs are concerned. Not only did we have a plethora of rumours and an entire new architecture being introduced to the market, but when the card was finally launched with the new Frontier edition of the card, many were expecting it to at the very least compete with the GTX 1080, probably surpass it. In fact, we really expected it to go toe-to-toe -to -toe really with the tie in many instances, but that just hasn't been the case. In fact, in the few reviews that have popped up of the Frontier edition, the GPU is in fact trailing the 1080 in a great number of titles. My name's Paul, and in this Regame and Citicom video, we're going to be exploring the RX Vega because a benchmark, actually a couple of benchmarks, have leaked out onto the internet and do hint that perhaps RX Vega will perform better than its cousin, which once again is aimed at the professional market. So the GPU core in question is 687F colon C1. This GPU might sound quite familiar to you. In fact, we've seen it several times before, but of course, those revisions were early engineering samples. In fact, those early engineering samples were running at considerably lower clock speeds. For example, um, it was quite often seen at around the 1200 MHz for the core, whereas the RAM, which of course is using HBM2, was running at just 700 MHz. A perusal a search, if you will, of the 3 Mark database, most specific, or more specifically, excuse me, 3 Mark 11, and you will find multiple new entries of this card. And what's perhaps most interesting is the fact that the clock speed has seen a major increase. The core clock has risen to 1630 megahertz, which is considerably better, whereas the memory bus clock goes up to 945. So what does that mean in terms of performance? Well, obviously the rest of the system does make a difference, but in terms of raw graphics score anyway, the highest level entry, or sorry, the highest scoring entry scores almost 32,000, 31,873. And then there are a couple of other entries with 30,681, another one scoring 30,632. And perhaps most telling of all, these results are much earlier. Perhaps mo most importantly, though, is these results are much newer. Uh, they uh, were deposited on the database on July the 4th of, of course, this year. Now, this, of course, means that the software, the hardware, is much closer to final production silicon, and in theory, at least, is much closer to release performance. So how does this compare with, let's say, the GTX 1080? Well, obviously it does depend because we have a lot of different models of the GTX 1080, many of them, of course, with hefty overclocks as standard. But you're looking at around the 27 to perhaps 28,000 mark if you're once again running the stock default GTX 1080. The Thai, however, has much higher um, performance and almost cracks 40,000. In fact, around the 37 to 38,000 is quite consistent for 3D Mark 11. So there are a couple of things for us to discuss with this. The first and perhaps most obvious is it only has 30 megahertz higher clock speed than its cousin. So I'm pretty sure you can agree that 30 MHz is not going to make the difference here, therefore it's most likely driver related. Or the other possibility is we're looking at something different in terms of the engine clock. So one thing that a lot of folks have kind of glazed over, and to be honest I'm somewhat guilty of doing this myself, is the typical engine clock that AMD themselves tell us that, Ra that Radeon Vega Frontier Edition hits. So the typical engine clock is being reported at 1382 megahertz with the peak at 1600. So obviously that's somewhat of a discrepancy. This does lend a lot of uh, weight to the argument that drivers definitely are causing some of the differences that you'd expect to see from Vega. In other words, I, th I think there's just too much of a gulf between how the card performs at its worst and how it performs at its best. Don't get me wrong, I just want to clarify that I don't believe that there should be no difference and that the card should perform identically across applications. So in other words, 
And let's say that you had graphics card A performing at 60 frames per second and the other graphics card B performs at 65 frames per second in one title. You wouldn't necessarily expect that percentage of a difference to remain consistent across all titles because obviously different ar uh, architectures just simply work better across different GPUs, but that's not been the case. In some cases, the GPU, that would be Frontier, of course, has just performed almost as bad as their GTX 1070. And just to clarify, I don't mean bad as in a 1070 is a bad card, I just mean that we expected more. Whereas on the other hand, in many cases, it's been about the 1080 levels, maybe slightly behind. And in one or two games, it's pretty much almost neck to neck with the 1080 tie. That to me is just too much of a golf. It's a chasm in performance. It, it's not, you know, the 10% here or there, or let's say you're getting 65 frames a second in one graphics card in one test and the other graphics card's getting 68 and the other one in another test, you know, graphics card A is getting 52 frames a second and graphics card B is getting, you know, maybe 60 one, it's not like that. It's it's much greater difference. So I do feel drivers are definitely causing some of the problems. And of course, for those who haven't watched some of my previous videos, I did discuss some of the issues with rasterization, the fact that the card doesn't seem to be culling correctly. But that's still a bit ambiguous because unfortunately we don't know just how the culling works exactly in the drivers because obviously we don't have RX... Um, Vega at the moment available to us. We don't have the final revision of the drivers, so how much of an improvement that's going to be remains, well, somewhat of a mystery. Of course, it's very unlikely we're going to see a 16 gigabyte Vega hit the store shelves anytime soon, as after all, right now, HBM2 stacks are pretty expensive, and that's one of the reasons we're seeing an 8 gigabyte option. And I don't really feel that in, uh, AMD can release a 4 gigabyte version of Vega. I mean, technically they could if the HPC works as intended, as they've shown it off to, where essentially it's much more efficient with memory, and we've discussed this a couple of times over, so I don't want to go too much over it in this vid very video. But if it does work like that in reality, perhaps you could, but I still suspect that in some games it just wouldn't really be conducive to that environment. Plus, in pure marketing standpoint, let's assume even it did, be, let's, let's be super PR-y about this. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt in, in terms of La La Land levels of PR and say that HBC did double the capacity of memory on the GPU. And it doesn't. But let's just say it did for a second. It still wouldn't work because people are going to criticize it because they say that it doesn't have enough memory. Uh, Raja Kadori went on stage and said that he wants to change the, the, the discussion of graphics cards from how much RAM does it have on the card to how much bandwidth does it have. But we both know, we all know, that it's actually a combination of all of these factors which help to promote a graphics card and also what makes the graphics card desirable to purchase. And I guess that really leads us to the next question. My personal feeling towards the card at the moment, and I'm not telling you that I'm right, I'm, this is my, this is my gut feeling, is the card is not quite gonna pip the tie, um, to the post. I don't think it's gonna do that. Maybe I'm wrong. Hopefully I am. I, I, because to me, if it's faster than the 1080 tie, that's good, because it perhaps pushes Nvidia to release a better card. Who knows? Maybe they could release a Pascal refresh, but I think it's going to be faster than the 1080 once the drivers settle down, and that's the other thing. You see, one problem AMD have right now, there's two issues. Well, there's three issues that are going to scupper the card. The first, does it perform as well as perhaps people expect it to? So can it really perform as well as the 1080, or perhaps better? The second, how expensive is it going to be? So, for example, let's say someone already owns an RX 390, just for the sake of argument, and they're already invested in FreeSync. They've got a FreeSync monitor, perhaps 1440p, and they're quite happy with that, and maybe, they, maybe they're waiting for a new card. Then you can probably convince that individual to go for Vega. But if someone's not really invested in that, maybe they're buying a new... Uh, PC entirely, then things become a little trickier. And of course, pricing does really lend itself to this issue, because HBM2 is not cheap to produce, and I do wonder if NVIDIA are just holding back, they're just waiting, getting as much profit as they can from Pascal, and then 
the moment Vega is released, they say, okay, now we're going to cut the price of our cards by $50. One thing that might stop them doing that is, well, mining. And that obviously is increasing the price of cards, but it's really hitting AMD slightly harder. The last issue is how much more can they push out of drivers? This is something we've discussed a couple of times now, so I don't, once again, want to go over it too much in this video. But, uh, for example, um, we've seen with the 4 AC, with the Polaris as a whole, the performance shot up drastically with it later iterations of drivers. Now, one argument, and a very good one, you could levy at both Pascal and Vega, how much more really has, in terms of optimization anyway, Pascal got left in the tank. Now, obviously, if there's a new title that which comes out, NVIDIA will probably release a new driver, which maybe fixes bugs, slightly improves performance, 5%, 10%, or what have you. But in reality, there's not going to be like major improvements in performance anymore. We saw, for example, DirectX 12 drivers, which drastically improved performance in double figures or more, actually, in some titles. But in reality, most optimizations now for Pascal are done, whereas Vega is going to get better over time. The problem is, let's say that AMD released this card, and let's say, let's be optimistic and say that the performance numbers we're seeing here are indicative to game performance, and that they may not necessarily be that because it's a synthetic, but let's say it is indicative, let's say it is exact. Let's say you have, let's, let's be super... Let's be super PR-y about this. And let's say it's got a 10% or 20% performance increase over a 1080. Well, to many, and it's kind of hard to argue against this, Vega has been somewhat late. So to many, let's say that it does end up being 20% faster than the 1080 on average, on launch. But then three months later... AMD have released multiple iterations of drivers, and those drivers improve performance to almost 1080 tie levels. Let's be really optimistic. The problem is to the, the average user, the 1080 tie is still the better performing card because they just remember those first benchmarks. So in my opinion, I maintain caution. I would say don't pre-order any graphics card unless you really need it. If you have one, the only time I would tell you to pre-order Vega is if, once again, you're invested in AMD, you've got a FreeSync monitor which you're really happy with, you really need a new graphics card, let's say you've got like a GTX, uh, sorry, uh, like an old card, like an RX uh, 460 or what have you that's been tidying you over, maybe you sold your high-end setup a while back, then in which case, by all means, pre-order Vega. But if you've not, if you're, you know, sitting on the fence and just waiting to see what happens, maybe you're waiting to build a new PC, don't pre-order Vega. Wait to see which one comes up on top and then go from there. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.